sends out a very clear message, whether it's intended or not, that, that these people are costing too much, their care costs too much, um, and uh, we need to address that somehow or other. And this is a very distasteful way to be addressing it, clearly. The palliative care, you know, would that change your view? What if people were feeling under pressure? Will it have an impact on, uh, you know, the doctor-patient relationship? Will people trust their doctors less? All these sorts of factors get thrown in. What you find is that support very, very rapidly falls away and that there isn't actually a majority public support at all for this once people start to think about the issue. Hello and welcome to another edition of the Evangelical Times podcast. Now today, as I record this on Wednesday the 16th of October, uh, a private member's bill has been introduced to the House of Commons, which aims to legalise assisted dying or assisted suicide. To discuss this, I'm joined by Gordon MacDonald, who is CEO of the Care Not Killing Alliance. Uh, Gordon, thanks for joining us. Just explain to us, what are your concerns about this bill? Well, I mean, this bill will legalise, for the first time in the UK, that a doctor can provide lethal drugs to one of their patients to end their life. You know, for over two millennia in Western medicine, we have applied the Hippocratic principles, the Hippocratic oath, which is that a doctor should do no harm and that they shouldn't give a poison to their patient with the intention of ending their life. And there's a reason for that. It's because uh, you know, the, these practices were commonplace in the ancient world and there were lots of abuses going on. Um, and so Hippocrates and, you know, doctors ever since have recognized that you need to have a, a proper set of ethical principles for medicine in order to ensure that it's for the benefit of people and not to do them harm. And that, you know, principle would be being thrown out, out the window with this legislation. You know, in any country in the world which is introduced a form of assisted dying, whether it's assisted suicide or euthanasia, what we've seen happen is consistently the criteria are expanded as more and more difficult cases get brought into the net. People who are vulnerable get put at risk. The numbers increase year on year. Uh, you know, children getting, you know, have a, have an extent to them. You have people with mental health problems being included, being euthanized. People who are depressed are not getting the treatment that they need. Palliative care often doesn't keep pace with demand um, and so is suffering in real terms. These are all the, the issues that arise and they're just skirted over and ignored by those who want to put autonomy and choice um, at the centre of everything in their lives and in, in medicine, including um, controlling their death. But if death is not something we can control, death is something we, we should um, alleviate the pain and the suffering associated with it. But ultimately, death comes to us all, and it's not about our control. It's about um, standing alongside those who are experiencing it and, and making it as bearable as possible for them. Those calling for a change in the law say, look, this is very narrow legislation. It will only deal with a few very difficult, heart-rending cases to alleviate their suffering. But is it your concern that once you unlock the door to this, there's, there's, there's really no end to how wide it can go? Yeah, because you've already accepted the principle that it's okay for one group of people to kill other people or to help them kill themselves. You know, what happens is the law on homicide is um, changed so an exemption is provided so that two doctors um, can can do that without being prosecuted. Uh, and once you do that, once you make that change, then the issue doesn't become, is it right or wrong? It becomes, in what circumstances should these people do it? And there's always some other difficult case or tragic circumstance which doesn't qualify and so the logical pressure for extending the law um, is there right from the start and that's what we've seen happen elsewhere. It extends more broadly and quicker in some places than others. I mean Canada is the, the worst case example of it but you know we've got to remember that in Canada all the politicians and the advocates are saying oh we'll not be like the Netherlands, we, we all have a careful law but then what has happened is it's expanded more rapidly and the numbers have increased much quicker in Canada than elsewhere. Sorry to interrupt, but if you're enjoying this discussion, why not subscribe to ET? 
simply visit evangelical-times.org and click subscribe. So we've seen Canada go down this road, uh, Belgium, the Netherlands, and as you've said, uh, the law has always been uh, extended and extended and extended to include young people. And that, that was never planned in the beginning, but then young people were included, people with mental health conditions. And I saw recently that even in Canada, some prisoners uh, had been offered assisted suicide. Is that correct? Well, quite possibly. Um, but I mean, there's been lots of cases hitting the headlines from Canada, not just um, people who are terminally ill, people who are chronically ill, you know, people with mental health problems are being helped to end their lives and, you know, being euthanized in Canada. You know, from 2027, you won't even need a physical illness. You'll just be able to do it for, with mental health problems. You know, and that was a law that was, you know, legislated for by the Canadian Parliament. Um, the Canadian Parliament is also considering extending it to children or for people with advanced directives. You know, this law just it keeps expanding and the numbers have gone up astronomically in Canada. You know, in the first year, uh, it was about just over a thousand. That was for a six month period. So maybe 2000, say, uh, for the whole year. Um, last year, it was over 15,000 people who, who had a euthanasia death and 99.9% .9 of them, you know, are euthanasia deaths. Maybe more than that is only single figures for its assisted suicide. So this is about shifting moral responsibility onto doctors and saying they, they are in some sort of, um, you know, semi divine position in society and they have a moral authority and we need to, to, you know, allow them to have this power. But actually what happens in Canada is you have a small number of doctors who are doing hundreds and hundreds of cases, um, others who are being drawn into it on an ad hoc basis. And, you know, one of the leading doctors on this has said, you know, it's the most enjoyable thing she's ever done in her career. You know, you do have to worry about people who are finding some sort of pleasure from being involved in the process of helping people to end their lives or of killing them themselves, and, and as is the case in Canada. And are you concerned about pressure that this is going to put on elderly people, vulnerable, um, those who might feel that they're a burden on their families or a drain on the healthcare system? Absolutely, because we know that, uh, you know, in Oregon, for example, nearly 50% of people, some, in some years over 50% of people, uh, it's because they feel that they're a burden on their friends or family or their or the healthcare system that's causing them to opt for this. And we know in Canada, you know, in 2022, I think it was 17% of people said that they were opting for this because they felt lonely. It's not that people don't qualify because they've got some sort of illness that can be defined as terminal, although prognosis is a very inexact science and whether they've got six months or a year to live, you know, is unclear. But, you know, they may have that, that condition. But the issue is, the reasons they're seeking it is because they're not getting the support they need to live. They might not be getting, you know, homeless benefits, or they might not be getting dis disability support, or they might be lonely, you know, in many cases, or they just find that their life is meaningless because of depression or because of other factors, or, the, you know, they might be under financial pressures. There are lots and lots of social reasons why people are seeking this, and it's not because they're terminally ill. The terminal illness is, is ancillary to the real reasons, which is, social reasons and emotional reasons and spiritual reasons and that's what should be addressed rather than the state taking upon itself the power to kill people. Now the government has said that this is not their bill, this is a private member's bill, it's a backbench bill. Uh, they have allowed uh, their MPs to have a free vote so they can vote according to their conscience and, and the government party won't control how they vote. But we know where the Prime Minister stands on this. He said he wanted to give Parliament time to debate this if they won the election. He said that he's personally in, in favour of it. Are you concerned at just how much support Downing Street is giving to this backbench bill? Well, the Prime Minister's position is clear uh, and half the Cabinet voted for Rob Maris's bill in 2015, although West Streeting has now changed his position because he recognises that palliative care and the health service are not in a a fit state to be able to cope with this and that it would just be extremely dangerous. But, you know, the Prime Minister has, has made his position clear and that puts pressure on new Labour MPs to vote for this because, you know, maybe they, they're looking at their career and thinking, well, if I can keep in with the Prime Minister, I'll, I'll get a promotion. Or maybe they're just following, you know, out of great gratitude to the Prime Minister for helping get them elected and, and thinking, well, you know, this seems to be the the line that's coming from the top and we've you know position has changed and we should support this. 
I have to say, I think it's a lot closer in Parliament than is being portrayed. I think an awful lot of MPs haven't really thought this through. They're, they're concerned about it. I think people should be getting in touch with their MPs and talking to them and going to see them and just explaining to them what their concerns are about this legislation. Because most MPs are probably haven't made up their mind one way or the other. They may agree in principle, but like the general public, have concerns in practice and think it's not safe in practice. So that's the messaging that MPs need to hear from their constituents. There is, though, a concern about what was going on in the background because there was a report in, in the media that you know MPs who'd come high up the private member's ballot had been offered to researchers if they were willing to bring this forward. That does raise significant issues and questions about who was funding that and who was making that offer. And our understanding is it came from um, sources within the Labour Parliamentary Party, um, whether or not the Prime Minister's team were involved in that is an open question. And that, I think, is something that does need to be bottomed out. Now, you say that you think it might be a lot closer in in, in Parliament than, than people um, are currently suggesting. Talk us through that. Talk us through the prospects in Parliament. It's been presented today. No debate today. There'll probably be the first opportunity to debate it next month. And then what happens next? Just talk us through the, the prospects as you see it. Well, what will happen on the 29th of November uh, is that there will be what's called a second reading debate. That will last five hours. Normally, what happens in these cases is that the, the bill is debated and, and often it runs out of time. But as you said earlier, the Prime Minister has indicated a willingness to give government time to allow this to be debated and voted on. So there will be the debate. Um, we will see whether or not it goes to a vote on that day or not. It might or it might not, depending on how Parliament votes. But if it does get through, um, then we'll move to what's called committee stage, where um, amendments will be um, debated um, and considered, and then a final bill will be presented to the whole parliament for what's called third reading. And then if it gets through that, it would then go up to the House of Lords and go through the same process. So I think there are there is a long way to go here, but at the same time, we are concerned that there may be manipulation going on, um, either at the committee stage or, or before that, in order to try and push this through, um, because it's seen potentially as something that Labour can do um, or the you know the the, the particular group um, who are supporting it within Labour can do early on before people have really thought about the issue, and obviously in the context of budget cuts, of taxes going up, of elderly people being um, targeted either through the removal of the winter fuel allowance or through taxes on pensions or inheritance taxes coming in because of the financial situation that the government um, is presenting to us as as being the state that the country's in. You have to ask, is this the right time even to be debating this? Because it sends out a very clear message, whether it's intended or not, that, that these people are costing too much, their care costs too much, um, and uh, we need to address that somehow or other. And this is a very distasteful way to be addressing it, clearly. Where's public opinion on this? Because I suspect, I haven't looked at the data, you probably have, that when people first hear about this, they think, oh, this is just an issue of personal choice and, and it's up to the individual. But then when they hear some of the arguments against it and they hear some of the risks that have been taken in other countries, people's opinion on this issue shifts. Is is that what you're finding? Yeah, I mean, opinion polling is not a, an easy way to judge public opinion because opinion polling is a very simple question that's asked. And when people are asked a simple question, they generally want to say yes to it. They don't want to say no. Um, and they don't want to seek to restrain other people's rights and freedoms or, or choices. Um, so that's why you always end up with high levels of support on the initial question. Of course, those high levels vary very dramatically depending on wh how the question is framed. So, you know, Dignity and Dying frequently come out with polling with the high 70s, even up to 80% support. But then they don't use British polling council standards when they're asking the questions. And the other polls, particularly one that King's College London did last week, came out with, I think it was a 63% or 62% um, level of support, which is like, you know, 15, 20% lower than what Dignity and Dying's polls come out with. So you have to ask what's going on there in the first place. But then when you present other arguments, as Care did in, in 2015 in the CNK 
repeated that poll as well. And, you know, you, uh, or even the King's College London poll, you, you say, well, you know, what about palliative care? You know, would that change your view? What if people were feeling under pressure? Will it have an impact on, uh, you know, the doctor-patient relationship? Will people trust their doctors less? All these sorts of factors get thrown in. What you find is that support very, very rapidly falls away and that there isn't actually a majority public support at all for this once people start to think about the issue. So that's why polling is is obviously a, a very sort of um, loose way to, to judge this issue and actually why politicians have always, when they've thought about it, rejected it because they realise it's much more complicated than opinion polls give. What really concerns me is, is that the Prime Minister and others seem to be just driven by the latest celebrity coming out and commenting. And whilst, you know, people like Esther Ranson's case is very tragic, you know, as was pointed out by Matt Dory from the Association of Palliative Medicine on the media this week, you know, she has already outlived the length of time that she expected. And, you know, she was saying last year she would it would be her last Christmas. And obviously we're approaching this Christmas, which is good news. But it also highlights what the problem with this sort of legislation is, is that many people, you know, having been given a, a diagnosis of terminal illness, will think that their life isn't worth living any longer and will opt for this, you know, months, quite probably years earlier than they would have otherwise have died and will miss out on, on all that life has to offer during those last few years of life, which can be the most special time for in terms of relationship healing and and other aspects of, of life. So it seems to me that the more the public hear about this issue, the less they like it, um, and that support for assisted dying melts away when they hear the arguments. Do you think the mainstream media are doing a good job at informing the public and giving a balanced view of both sides of this debate? Well, I would say that up till now, the answer to that would have been no. I mean, we've had a consistent pressure, not least from the BBC, but from other sources such as the Times and, you know, the Mirror, um, now sadly the Daily Express as well, which has been bought over by the Mirror, pushing this line, you know, that this is the compassionate thing to do and it's a progressive thing to do and it's inevitable and we need to change the law. Actually, now that there's a live bill coming before Parliament, we've seen a bit more balance in the media and there's been quite a few voices. Even the Times had an editorial which had done a 180-degree turnaround the, the last week. So we are sort of beginning to see people thinking, hold on a minute here, is this really the right thing to do? The New Statesman's just got a piece today as well about that. So that's interesting because it, it shows what the polling shows, that people agree with it in principle, but then when they actually think about it, they think, well, maybe this isn't quite as safe as it's made out to be. Maybe we shouldn't be rushing into this. Maybe we should hold off here. Uh, and that, I think, is what we've seen in the last week or two in the media debate over it too. So will will the media change? Well, some some of the media obviously will take positions strongly against. Others will take positions strongly in favour. One would have hoped that the BBC, being a public service broadcaster, might be a bit more balanced. But sadly, our experience has been over 20 years that the BBC has consistently pushed one line in not only in its news, but also in its doc documentaries and its dramas. They did have a slight rebalancing with Liz Carr's documentary, Better Off Dead, earlier this year, which is excellent and people should watch. But, you know, that's one documentary, you know, over 20 odd years, whereas actually there have been successive documentaries pushing the other side of the argument for years and years and years. If people want to know more about this issue and want to inform themselves of the latest news on this particular bill as it progresses through Parliament, but also just wider information about the issue in general, where, where can they go to to get more information about it? Um, they can obviously go to our website, carenotkilling.org.uk. Um, we did have a bit of a hiccup this morning, so if 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 you can't get on today, then um, try again, basically, but it should be sorted out now. Um, you can go to um, other sources too. There's this Our Duty of Care campaign that, that we run, which is for medics and, and healthcare workers. You can go to their website, ourdutyofcare.org.uk. You can go to Living and Dying Well, which is another campaign organization or or many of the other organizations like care or christian institute or you know even jalco alliance there's lots of organizations that will have information on these issues where people can go to and you know they're welcome to get in touch with us directly you know in our office join our mailing list and we'll keep them informed about what's happening as the bill goes through parliament and in the future as well 
Gordon, thanks very much for your time today. And we may well speak to you again on this topic in the future. Thank you.